Oh, good afternoon. So my name's Ken, and I'm going to be looking at the security of the Internet of Things and some of the crazy examples of toys and other smart devices that have got it completely wrong. Now, I'm an ethical hacker, a security researcher, if you like, and I spend a lot of time looking at smart stuff. And most of the time, I found out that it's not quite so smart as we thought. Now, you've probably seen some of our work in the past. One of my favorites of all time was some work we did on the Samsung Smart TV. And we discovered it was listening to you. And not only was it listening to you, it's taking what you said and then sending it across the public internet, unencrypted, to be turned into text. That was a bit of a bad day, but Samsung don't kind of like us so much. But I want to start off with some fun. And I want to tell you all about my tea kettle. But this is a cool tea kettle. This is a Wi-Fi tea kettle. Now, there's one of these in most European homes. It's awesome. The idea being that you wake up in the morning, you get out the mobile app, you roll over, you press the button, and by the time you get to your kitchen, you've got a kettle full of boiling water, saving you maybe 30 seconds of your life. This is why you need a Wi-Fi kettle. It's really cool. Now, I looked at this and thought, I wonder. And the hacker in me, the security researcher, is going, hmm. This looks interesting. So I started doing what I always do, which is take things apart. I got a habit of taking things apart. I started off with the base here. Now, this is where all the smarts are. That's where the, um, the Wi-Fi module is located. I took it apart with a screwdriver, and I found this. I found a Wi-Fi module bolted into it. I thought, hmm, I recognize that module. That's a VSD03. I know that one, and I think I found the data sheet for it. So I thought, how am I going to attack a wireless tea kettle? So the first thing you do is you'll port scan it. You'll try and find ports and services. You'll then start learning about it, reading up, finding manuals, finding data sheets. Then we'll look at the source code. And finally, we'll see where they got it wrong, and we'll end up making tea. So where did we go? The first place I wanted to go is I started connecting to it to see what I could find. Let's just see if that's uh, there. So I found on there the Telnet port. Now, the first thing we know is Telnet is an unencrypted protocol. That's a really bad place to start. But then I saw this. A nice terminal, so I connected to it. AT. See the words AT top left? Now, those of you out there with a bit of gray hair will probably remember the Hayes AT modem command set from 40 plus years ago. And that's what I love about the Internet of Things. It's like turning time back. It's turning back the clock in terms of security to old, insecure protocols. Great. But now I'm stuck. There's a password. I don't know what the password is. So, how am I going to hack my smart kettle? Well, that's when I went to the manual. And I found the manual here. It's on the internet. You can download it for free. I thought, oh, interesting. Lots of, lots of cool stuff in there. And I thought, let's do something mad. Let's look for the password. What have we got? Where is it? Password. Default password, no way. Really? Surely the vendors changed this. One, two, three, four, five, six. Boom. Ah, now we're talking kettle. We're in a good place, right? But I still need to understand more. I've got a terminal, but I don't know how to interact with it. And that's when I need to know more. That's when I start thinking about the mobile app. Now, if I want to get into a mobile app, what I need to do is reverse engineer it. Typically, that's easier in Android, because I can very quickly take it from the Android package file, the APK, and then turn it into a jar, a Java resource, which I can read. And that's what I've done here. I've simply decompiled it. Really, really easy to do. But I need to know how the mobile app talks to the kettle. So I started looking through, and the first place I looked for was that password. And there we go, there's the password. And now I can start to see how the kettle is configured to talk to your home Wi-Fi router. And then there I can see some interesting commands. AT commands, great, that one. I looked at it in the manual. That's telling the base kettle to look for your home Wi-Fi router. Then look for its SSID, its Wi-Fi address name. And then ENCRY. So that's WPA, WPA2, or WEP if you're stupid. But then down here, I found something more interesting, AT plus key. Now I'm thinking, that's, that's got to be quite interesting. What can I find there? So I tapped it in, and I recovered your Wi-Fi key. So I can drive past your house. I can point a directional Wi-Fi antenna towards your kitchen. I can de-authenticate your kettle, connect it to me, six zeros, 80 plus key, and now I've got your Wi-Fi encryption key. So now I can get onto your home Wi-Fi router. I can potentially intercept all your traffic, 
If you haven't changed your router admin password, I can change your DNS. I can have everything just because you wanted to put a smart kettle on your home network. And then there was something really nuts as well. Now, I then wanted to look at resetting the kettle. What would happen in the event of a factory reset? So you have to hold down one of the buttons for 10 seconds, and you wait for the kettle to restart, which takes a few moments. Let's try this. Is it going to come up? Come on, you know you want a kettle. This sometimes is a bit flaky. There you go, we're up again. Good, right, so what we're going to do now is connect back to it. Now remember, I factory reset this kettle, so it should be completely clean. Use the same technique. Look, the Wi-Fi key survived a factory reset. So that means I can go onto eBay and buy second-hand kettles and buy your Wi-Fi keys. And because the sender puts the return address, I know where they live, too. So you can go out there and buy the keys to hack people's home network. That is crazy, wouldn't you agree? So what other nuts things did we do? Well, we gave this to the vendor privately. We go through what we call responsible disclosure, where we give our research away for free. And they kind of didn't respond to us. They kind of, we know they read our emails. They didn't, they didn't really engage. They weren't talking to us. They weren't, didn't seem interested. They didn't seem it was, think it was a problem. So guys, this, this isn't good. There's a major flaw in one of your products, and you're not fixing it. So we spoke to a journalist, and he said, hmm, now that's really interesting. So he managed to get in touch with them, got a response that intimated that you'd need specialist knowledge, not my $15 Wi-Fi antenna and a Kali Linux distro, and you'd also have to find someone. And that's where there's an interesting feature of Wi-Fi, in that it's trackable. So if you ever use the website wiggle.net, W-I-G-L-E, -E, that is a war driving database, and you can use that, search it, and find all the kettles. There you go. So there's all the kettles in the west of London right now, so you can just go and find stuff to hack. That's nuts. Surely it should be better. Now, there is some good news. I first found that vulnerability three years ago. And the vendor, over time, has actually improved. And this is their latest offering, uh, their 3.0 kettle. That's the 1.0. It was pretty flaky. This one's much more secure. But it did take them a long time to get there. And it's a real shame that so, so many bad experiences were found along the way. They chose the wrong chipset when they started out. But finally, about 12 months ago, they got it right. And they're now doing good, secure kettles. But what a shame it had to, uh, uh, had to happen that way. So the next place I want to go is somewhere a bit crazy. This is a little friend of mine. This is my friend Kayla. And this is another piece of research I did about three and a half years ago. This is, this is cool. By the way, just, just occasionally I fly, I fly with carry-on baggage, and I get some really weird looks from the TSA when I do this. <laughs> But anyway, this is Kayla. She's an interactive talking doll. So she has a microphone and a speaker, and she connects to your cell phone. And your child can have interactive conversations with a doll. And I thought, that's, that's really cool, right? But then the hacker in me is, spidey senses are tingling, going, I wonder. When I saw her in the store, I thought, hmm. Picked up the box, and it said, big sticker said, internet safe, kid friendly. And it also suggested that she had anti-profanity filters. So if the child swore at the toy, the toy would ignore it and go and tell them to speak to their parents. I thought, oh, I wonder how she does that. And I looked at her and thought, I wonder if I can make you swear. <laughs> but before we go there, a little bit more detail about how she works. So microphone, speaker, and Bluetooth. So you can genuinely connect it to your cell phone, and you can make calls on the doll, should you wish. Now. <laughs> In the UK, it's, it's illegal to drive with your, with your phone to your ear. But um, you can, by all accounts, drive with a doll to your ear. But <laughs> I, I asked a police officer um, once what he, what he thought, and he said he'd definitely arrest me, but he wasn't quite sure which law I'd broken. But hey, anyway. <laughs> so what I wanted to know is I reverse engineered her, and this is my crazy diagram that explains how we make it work. We found lots of different ways of making her cuss. The first one we found is that when you connect your cell phone to your car, to your hands-free kit, you have to put in a pin, right? And that sets up a type of frequency hopping which delivers a form of encryption, which is secure. She, however, when you connect to her, she has no pin. She will connect to any Bluetooth audio source in range. So she's effectively promisc promiscuous over Bluetooth. So there were some creepy things you could do. If this doll was switched on in your child's bedroom, for example, and some nefarious individual was outside in the street, 
they could connect to the doll and speak to your child. Or more scarily, they could also listen to the microphone and bug your child's bedroom. And I think that's really distasteful. I think it's really qu quite sickening that vendors would do this and sell product that can be used to creep on our kids. But that was frankly too easy. What I wanted to do more was then take the application apart and find out how it did this no swearing thing. And in there, once I'd reverse engineered it, I found a SQLite database with, it was called Z bad words, and it had 1,536 really choice swear words. <laughs> so I deleted it. <laughs> and guess what? <laughs> she swears like a docker. Now, if there are any kids in here, <laughs> if there are any children here, I think it might be a good idea to um, cover your ears right now, but we'll give it a go and see if she's going to play back. Uh, let's have a go. So I've recorded her for you because she's a little bit shy doing this live. Let's have a go. Hey, calm down, or I will kick the shit out of you. <laughs> I'm a, such a bad guy, aren't I? Anyway, so we gave this to the vendor, as we always do. We go through responsible disclosure, and, and the vendor kind of didn't really respond. They didn't think it was important. They thought we'd just kind of go away, and they did something they thought would fix it. So they encrypted the SQLite database. I thought, OK, that's a good idea. SQL Cypher is the right way to do it in Android. You can encrypt a database, and it's all good. Unfortunately, they encrypted it, with, encrypted it with a static encryption key. So you could just retrieve the key, and it was the same key for every install of the app. So it's just one more step. We had the key, decrypt it, and she swears all over again. Crazy, hey? But do you know what makes me cross is that security is not that difficult. If, if you care as an organization, security isn't that difficult. And a great example is, is this. Um, this is BB-8, the cool toy from the Star Wars movies. I've actually lost his head. Um, that's a bit awkward, but I don't know where it's gone. And we found a minor security bug. There was an issue whereby the firmware was pushed plain text. And do you know what? I found that on, on Christmas Day, a couple of years ago, I'd, my son got one of these for Christmas. And by the evening, I'd been reverse engineering it. He wasn't best pleased with me. But do you know what's cool is the vendor, they responded straight away, and they fixed that bug over the holiday um, season in under two weeks. That's really cool. What an awesome vendor. So security isn't difficult if you care. If you put time and effort into it, it's not going to set you back. But let's look at some other crazy things we've seen. I want to look next at Ring. Now, who's familiar with Ring? Anyone got a, a Wi-Fi doorbell recently acquired by Amazon? I've got a Ring. This is, this is my Ring doorbell here. It doesn't work so well anymore because like most things, I took it apart. Um, my colleagues don't like me very much because I'm, I'm good at taking things apart, but not so good at putting them back together. Um, I've currently got a $70,000 Tesla Model S in pieces. It doesn't, doesn't work anymore. I've got the firmware out of it, which Tesla open sourced a couple of weeks ago. But hey, that was expensive. Um, so anyway, here's, here's my not functioning ring, ring doorbell. And um, this is a little while back. And again, cool vendor, actually. We, we thought they were quite, quite cool. We discovered that you could actually unbolt the, um, the doorbell from the door using two screws. It was a, a Torx T6. And there's a red button on the back. And I had to press red buttons. And once we'd done that, we discovered it popped up a web server with a no, no encryption that anyone could connect to. And you could recover your Wi-Fi key from it. And that was quite cool, which meant from outside your house, I could hack your Wi-Fi. Awesome. Now, Ring were good. They responded straight away to that and got it fixed almost immediately, which is great. They were a cool vendor. I think that was awesome. But then there was a problem much more recently. There was a bug reported that I was asked to comment about. If you gave someone else master access to your doorbell, maybe your partner, if you then wanted to revoke that access, you couldn't. And there was a case documented of someone whose partner had split up. They thought they got rid of their account, but said partner carried on creeping and stalking them through their video doorbell. So it's really, really important that you can revoke all forms of access just in case, particularly when it's something as important as your front door to your house, your security system. And another crazy one, this is CloudPet. Hopefully you saw this about 18 months ago. This is the CloudPet. It's a bit like my friend Kayla can do quite cool stuff. Um, the idea being is that you can send messages to your kids through their teddy, which is great. And I understand they're actually very popular in the military. So when parents are stationed overseas on active service, they can actually send cool messages back to their kids and have interactive conversations. What a great idea. What, what a lovely thought with IoT. Except that they got hacked. And they lost all the passwords for everyone's accounts and nearly 2 million sets 
the recordings of kids' voices were compromised as well. Now that was manufactured by an organization called Spiral Toys. And it was so, so much concern that the Senate asked formal questions of the manufacturer. And as far as I can make out, the manufacturers disappeared. They've gone to the wall. And that's pretty bad, isn't it? Next crazy place. I find some pointless IoT from time to time. And this is my refrigerator. It's awesome. It's got an interactive screen on the front with a camera on the inside of the door. So you can go up to it and see what's inside the door from the outside. Okay, that's I don't know about you, but I'll just open the door, right, and have a look inside. But it also has some, some cool functions. So it has functions like a shared family calendar. So you can put your family schedule on the refrigerator, and it will synchronize with a Gmail account so it can pick up that calendar and you can pop later from your cell phone. Really cool. And we found some problems. Now, it used encryption. It used SSL or TLS to encrypt the connection between the refrigerator and your Wi-Fi router. But what it forgot to do was implement what we call certificate pinning. It forgot to check the validity of the encryption certificate. So we could intercept it. We could man the middle, and we could steal your Gmail password from your refrigerator. And we think that's really crazy. Surely it can be done better than that. But the last place I want to go to is look at some really quite concerning errors. Now, at the moment, these are threats to our identity. But I want to look at threats to us threats to our houses, threats to our, our nations that IoT brings out. Already we've seen some really significant attacks through IoT. You may be familiar with the Mirai DDoS botnet that was formed about 18 months ago. And what was interesting about it, it was attributed to being an IoT botnet. Well, it wasn't strictly an IoT botnet. It was actually a CCTV botnet. It was a result of compromise of the digital video recorders that people put inside their houses that record the CCTV. And a manufacturer at the core, at the core, core of the um, production process had written some insecure firmware, which meant that all the DVRs, even though you put them on your home network behind your Wi-Fi router, were exposed on the public internet. And hundreds of thousands of them were on the public internet, and it was trivial to hack them. So hackers came along and said, oh, I'll compromise that. And I'll use that and join it to my botnet, and we will hammer the websites of some organizations. And they took down Brian Krebs website for a period of time, very famous security researcher. So we're buying IoT. Manufacturers aren't taking responsibility for its security, and we're exposing ourselves to hack. But a proof of concept I want to show you is around taking control of the heating in your home. We wanted to know if we could compromise a smart thermostat. People had talked about ransom in IoT, but no one had done it. And we did this proof of concept for the DEF CON um, show a couple of years ago. And we wanted to see if we could genuinely hold a smart thermostat to ransom. Could we hijack your heating? Could we turn your AC off in the middle of the summer? Could we turn your heating off in the middle of winter? Could we freeze you out of your home devices? So that's the device we found. And the first place I would go with research in IoT is get on the FCC website. Because anything that has RF emissions, so Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Zigbee, Z-Wave, is going to have a registration with the FCC. So you can go and search it and find images of the hardware for the devices before you've even bought them. And the one interesting part for me here, I don't know if you see on the right-hand side, see those six brass holes? That's JTAG. That's a low-level interface that I can connect to and recover the firmware from if it hasn't been set up properly. So I can start to extract the software that's running on the chips, and I can start to find interesting security flaws. But I went a bit further with this smart stat and discovered a configuration routine, a programming app, and in there, ready for me. So I didn't have to get my logic probes out, didn't have to get my logic analyzers. I found the firmware. Great. I've got the firmware now. now Firmware usually comes in one big binary blob, a dot bin. And I need to turn that into a file system that I can read. And you'd usually use a tool such as uh, Binwalk, and that will turn the binary into a file system. And those of you who know your Unix and Linux will recognize that. Great. We got a lucky hit, got straight in, got the file system. Cool. And then very quickly, we found a series of interesting vulnerabilities. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with the idea of SQL injection for web applications, where user input isn't validated properly. We find similar problems in firmware, in compile code. So there is a, a copy command, uh, Linux CP. It's concatenating 
a copy of an image file to act as a desktop wallpaper on the thermostat. So you can upload your family photographs on your thermostat. But unfortunately, that command doesn't verify that it's an image it's uploading. So we could execute arbitrary code at that point and take root on the thermostat. We find all sorts of problems in IoT firmware. I don't think that developers really understand that security researchers and hackers exist. I think they write their firmware and think that no one's ever going to see it ever again. And to underline that, we got some, some more code out of that um, firmware and found some crazy stuff. So when it makes an SSL connection, because it does use SSL, if that connection fails, the developer called it the underhandled SSL shit status. Wow, that's production code. But it also has the ability to upload more than just one image. It can upload three images, and you can wipe between them the desktop wallpaper. And the command that deals with the wiping between is called son of a bitch mode. <laughs> wow. So if this is what they're calling commands and routines, what hope have we got for their security? That's shipping. You can still buy that now. Now, as a result of that, we got root on the thermostat. We got a complete compromise remotely, and we managed to hold it to ransom. Um, we had remote control over it. What we do, we were cycling the lockout pin that stops your kids from messing with the thermostat and locking the user out. And with remote control over IRC, we had it done. We had complete control over your heating. The only bit we got wrong was the Bitcoin exchange rate moved a bit between us coding the exploit and actually presenting it. So that's about $7,000 worth of ransom at the moment for a $200 thermostat. But hey, but that's just crazy, right? I'm attacking one person. What I really want to know is, can I bring this together to make something that's potentially a weapon? Can IoT be turned against us? Is our desire to buy and automate our houses, can that actually be used as a weapon against more than just individuals? And we realized that thermostats switch large quantities of power, AC and heating. And we realized that if you've got compromise of large numbers of thermostats, because we've all got the same um, the same security flaw, we can synchronously trigger large numbers of devices at the same time. So what if we waited until the supply and demand were roughly the matched on the grid on a very hot day when everyone's AC is really going, and we waited till they were close, then we triggered everything off and everything on, and you create huge power spikes that the grid can't cope with, and you create what's called a black start event when large um, swathes of the power grid go offline, and it takes time to resync the various generation of substations. So you can create significant outages because of our desire to use IoT. And vendors lack of care and attention when developing those products. So we've got potentially a nation state grade weapon that can be used against us, and that bothers me. I think that weak IoT should be banned. I don't think we, we as consumers should be able to buy insecure product. This little lady has been banned. She's illegal to own in Germany. There's a 25,000 euro fine for possession, which is a bit awkward because I took her to Frankfurt last week. But hey, I'm still here. <laughs> the European Consumer Organization, Bayek, advised that people destroy the doll. She's been banned in Norway, in the Netherlands, and several other countries. eBay has banned her in some European territories because they think the security is so poor, she shouldn't be allowed. There's some really cool stuff going on in the US Senate. There's a draft bill right now about cybersecurity regulation. I think it's brilliant. I think it's going to be a while before we see anything debated in any detail, but that is a really cool bill. It's worth a read. It's only a few pages long, and it's all about the US government and agencies agreeing they're only going to buy secure IoT and using their purchasing power to drive the market. Good on you. I think that's a really good idea. In the EU, we're seeing some, some movement. Um, they're taking a little bit longer, and there's a lot more detail behind it. But there is progress towards IoT being regulated in terms of security. And I think that's fantastic news. I think it's going to take time. I think we need regulation and legislation. I think, I think we need to see manufacturers who are selling us insecure product being held to account. We need some regulation to stop them selling it to us. And I think we also, frankly, we need to see some litigation. We need to people see these people's asses sued. There are two class action suits I'm aware of that have settled in the US so far, which resulted in significant payouts for people who bought IoT. 
and discovered subsequently it was very, very insecure. Unfortunately, those two examples are um, smart adult toys. Um, and the vendors were collecting rather more data than perhaps I think the consumers suspected. They were collecting not only your name address from your account that you logged into and created, but they're also collecting your location and how you're using the device, <laughs> which is probably more information than you wanted the vendors to be, uh, to be looking at. But we've only seen a couple so far, so I do hope there's more action in that uh, space in the meantime. I blog about IoT security every day. That's my Twitter. My LinkedIn is there. My blog is full of advice, tips for developers, tips for integrators, tips for vendors, and then tips for you, ways to work out if the IT product that you've got is secure or not. So hopefully, you can stop this happening to you. Thank you. Thank you, Kev. That was brilliant.